Hi, everybody. This is David, and welcome to Module 2, Fireside Chat, Inclusive Classroom Strategies for Turbo University. It is May 23rd, 2017, and we are now into our second week of class. So I have the Fireside Chat all typed out and ready to go right here. Um, and actually even on the back. So um, what today's format will be like for the fireside chat. So first of all, like listen to the fireside chats. Um, uh, a few of you I could tell didn't listen to the week one fireside chat because when you wrote about inclusion and mainstreaming, you really took the perspective solely of just the WEAC article. And I focused extensively on that in the week one fireside chat um, and, and offered a kind of, a, I think, a much different perspective on it than, than what was in the WEAC article. So I'm just asking, you know, take take the time to go and, and to listen to this fireside chat. Um, each of you will be mentioned in today's chat, and I will talk about something that you've posted. I'm going to elaborate on it. So each of you do have your personal shout out in the fireside chat. And so this is the way it'll be for the rest of the class, module, you know, three, four, five, six, uh, seven. And um, so this is for the week of May 22nd through May 28th, 2017. Please, please continue to be active posters, okay? Be active posters to class. If you haven't posted to class in three or four days, guess what? I'm going to get a hold of you. I'm, I'm going to drop you an email. And if that doesn't work, you know, I'm probably going to text you or call you or something like that. So you need to be accessing class um, and especially making sure that you are getting your post in. Your post, and if you just need to, you know, watch the video on the introduction of class, anything that is due during the module has a due date next to it, you know, due and, and whatever. It's in the topic line. So make sure you're getting that in. Um, I'm going to let things ride a little bit. So if you didn't get your things, you know, completely in during week one, um, I'm going to give you a little time here in week two to catch up. But after that, you know, then, um, you know, if you haven't submitted your work on time, it is not going to be credited. So um, make sure you're, you're getting your stuff in. So, yes, continue to be active posters. Grades haven't been entered. You might look in the grade book and see a few grades um, and... Yes, I mean, some grades I've put in, some I haven't, some grades I haven't made visible yet. Do not worry about grades until I make a post in the announcements thread, and that post will say, hey, grades have been entered for modules like 1, 2, and or 1, 2, and 3, whatever. So right now, don't worry about grades. If you do see a dash, that just means I haven't entered a grade. Um, if you see a zero, that means a grade has been entered in the grade of zero. That would be of concern, but um, I haven't done that for anybody. So yes, if you just see a dash and you're wondering, it's like, why is it my grade? And you know, part of my part of the grades are in part of it. Don't worry about it. It it I'll, there's a process I have. It all kind of um, gets put in at at, at one time. So um, the dun, 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 Again, I encourage you to watch these fireside chats. They're not mandatory, but I, again, if you watch these, I'm going to talk about the previous module, the upcoming module, and give you the fireside chat. Plus, I'm going to share some pretty cool anecdotes. This is real time. So this is what, what you've been posting to class, what the constructs are that are developing, the themes, some contemporary things. Um, so, yeah, I don't record these. You know, the module one that was recorded ahead of time, of course, is because class... Um, starts before I get to know any of you. It takes a little bit of time. Um, but these are all posted in real time. So today is May 23rd. It is 925 at night. I'm recording this. When it's done, I will upload it to YouTube, and tomorrow morning you'll be able to see it. So, uh, dun, 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 dun. Module 1. Let's talk about Module 1. Let's reflect. So Module 1. Uh, we talked about the history of inclusion and, and kind of inclusion awareness. We also, you know, there was the the introduction to the history of, of the turbo, um, which I think is important because um, 
Viterbo has a strong commitment to being a community partner and to uh, educating servant leaders and to receive your education, receive your degree from Viterbo, um, to me, definitely ha has a recognized prestige out in the field. Um, so that's just my own opinion. I've, I've been instructing with Viterbo uh, for, what, 14 years, something like that. Uh, I, I love it. I absolutely admire um, and revere uh, the university and and uh, it's it's a wonderful place to matriculate. So you've made a good decision. Um, I want to talk about an experience about inclusion awareness and what inclusion meant to me, how I became aware of inclusion when I was younger. So um, I remember being in elementary school and probably maybe around fourth grade, somewhere around there, but, um, you know, the Individuals with Disability Education Act, or basically Education Education Act for students with disabilities in schools, um, you know, that really came to, to take root in the mid to late 70s. Um, and, you know, before that, you know, students were either not, you know, they were educated or they were institutionalized or it was strictly, um, you know, in, in off-site placements. But, um, you know, we, we saw the, you know, first attempts at inclusion kind of start in the 1970s. So I attended a 100-year-old four-story brick school. Okay, and this was back in the 70s. <laughs> it, was, it was 100 years old back then. Um, it's gone. It's gone. It's replaced with a new building. Um, but I remember one day outside the back of the school, which is somewhat symbolic in this, they pulled up a yellow mobile home and parked it, and there was a ramp, and it went just outside the back door of the school. Didn't have any, any sign on it. Didn't, didn't say like what the building was for. Um, and this, this mobile home shows up outside of the school. And none of us knew what it was for. Um, at the same time this mobile home appears, we start to experience some changes in the schedules of some of our classmates. They disappear for parts of the day. They're gone. Where did they go? And one of my friends, John, would disappear for part of the day. We didn't know why. Um, what happened was John went to the Yellow Mobile Home. That was where special education services were delivered. Okay. Now, I want to step back and not portray this in a negative light. This, these were the first steps in inclusion, okay? Um, but we were never told what the yellow mobile home was. So you start to, you know, it, it, it gets this mysterious, this, you know, what's this all about? What are, what's happening out there? And, and, uh, you know, pretty soon, you know, it gets the moniker if it's the place where the kids that aren't smart go and stuff like that. But John would go out to the yellow mobile home and uh, come back a couple hours later, and he'd have the coolest stickers you could imagine. And I was a good friend of his. He would give me some of these stickers. Now, these were not the irregular stickers. These were like the coolest stickers you could have. And he would give me some of those. But he never talked about, like, where he was or what he, he did. And for my entire rest of my years, it was a K-8 building. I never knew what the yellow mobile home really was about other than students like John went out to that yellow mobile home for part of their day. And maybe some were out for all of their day. I don't know. And then they came back. And you never never knew really when they were coming back and never knew when they were going. Um, now, when we got to, to high school, high school had a special education room, labeled special education room. Sign outside the room said special education room. 
And there, there was more of a awareness of, of what special education was, um, just for the fact of what students would, would share that went to that room. They would say, this is, you know, get extra help in this and that. And it, it, it was very visible. It was just incorporated as part of the school. But even then, there wasn't any knowledge of disability awareness and education of really what happens in that room other than students get help with assignments. That was kind of it. So um, goals of public education. Uh, this in, this was well articulated uh, within somebody's post. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't give you credit right now for this, but because um, I can't remember, <laughs> but uh, I, I didn't write it down. But it, it, the goals of public education vary per the perspective of the student, the teacher, the administrator, the taxpayer. So, um, yeah, I mean, if if you're the student, you want to be included with your peers. That is very important to you. Um, you know, if you're the the teacher, inclusion comes with kind of the caveat of. I'm for inclusion. I'm also for common planning time with the special education teacher and pushing services and co-teaching and things that support the foundational structures of inclusion. Um, and you also run into these these things too of like inclusion doesn't mean that you have four um, sections of third grade and one teacher is really good at teaching quote unquote those students students with high needs. So that is a teacher who is going to receive those students, and that's where those students will be included. That's not equitable. That's going to cause burnout. And all of that, that really does is tracking. That's so, um, you know, just, just to, to put that out there. That's, that's, um, so, but yeah, so from an administrator standpoint, that might be inclusion saying, well, we're included, but the fact is you're not really included. You're just, uh, monopolizing the skills of, of one teacher versus making all of your teachers stronger and, and providing the opportunity for diversity across all of the students in that third grade. And then, of course, a taxpayer. Um, a taxpayer sees mainstreaming um, and does does not probably see inclusion, you know, views mainstreaming of students with disabilities, um, in classrooms with regular education students. Taxpayers also can, um, and, and board members, I, I've seen this. It's actually, it's happened. It's happened in districts close to where I live. Board members get elected, start to look at costs, scrutinize costs, and they'll say, you know, we spend a lot of money on special education students, so can we, can we cut back and not, you know, not understanding the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, least restrictive environment, um, and then, you know, those, those, those issues, issues surface. It, it almost becomes a, a, this group of students versus this group of students. Part of that's been set up, and I talked about that in the week one fireside chat of the Individuals with Disability Education Act, uh, mandating least restrictive environment, variety of environments, op opportunities for students with disabilities. Then you have NCLB, now it's Every Student Succeeds Act, basically saying, you know, we want all students, mainstreamed or quote unquote included, but really mainstream. Um, and, and our emphasis is going to be heavy on reading and math. We're going to measure when kids get out, how many, you know, kids are going on a post-secondary and you're going to get ratings on that. And that's the emphasis. And so you, so you have these two pieces of legislation that, that want to do battle with each other. Um, and, and school boards also run into that then of saying, well, you know, our school report card, our school report card reports out, you know, reading math, and it does have some stuff on achievement gaps and whatever. But, um, you know, we want to make sure that our school report card is as positive as it can be for people considering moving into our community and so forth. So maybe that means we are going to cut, if, you know, we have a finite budget, we're going to cut some classes, um, you know, like our um, – consumer economics classes, maybe some of, you know, welding, some of those things that that um, aren't tested and replace those and put more emphasis into reading. And so you, you're losing this this roundedness, you know, once you, you do that. I mean, you're, you're putting money into what is being tested at a, at a state and federal level, 
with kind of disregard to what your overall needs and reality of the student population is. And, and you know, the encouragement of all students are going to college. And this is, you know, it, it, it's, it's such a disservice to students to have that, that kind of hidden, almost hit, I guess, overt mandate out there. Um, but, you know, students can do very, very well going into, you know, trade schools also, you know, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, um, you know, different areas um, in that capacity. So um, anyway, so goal of pub public education, yes, uh, to understand that. And, and I guess that is, it's hard to get into rate of reliability because, you know, if you're a student, teacher, administrator, you're seeing this from different perspectives. It's what, you know, being underneath the horse or, or, or elephant, you're blindfolded, and it depends on what part of the elephant you're, you're holding, the trunk or a leg or whatever, you know, and, and how you would describe what it is. And um, the WEAC article. So I posted the WEAC article um, because it, it has a lot of information in it about inclusion, but th that's the type of article parents are going to find when they go online and search about inclusion. That's the article that'll pop up. It's really written for that level of understanding of, to kind of give you the basic understanding of inclusion. It's not going to get real deep. It's going to be more on that first order thinking of like, here it is. Um, not no, necessarily like why or, or kind of like the theories behind inclusion, but like here's what inclusion is and trying to define out some of the terms. It's a good starting point, but in week two with the JURN article on disability or, or advantages and disadvantages of inclusion, it gets, it gets deeper kind of from a research perspective. But um, one of the things with the WEAC article is uh, – I want you, if you haven't gone back and, and listened and, and watched the week one fireside chat where I go in and I talk about mainstreaming and inclusion and tolerance and acceptance, um, I really get much, much deeper than what the WEAC article gets. And that's where I want you to be, is I want you to realize like the WEAC article is like a first order level thinking article. That's the article you're, that's going to come up if parents or somebody does a quick search on, okay, what is inclusion? What is mainstreaming? So forth. And but if you get deeper into asking why into understanding that at a, at a deeper level of thinking, um, that second level of thinking, that's where my presentation during that week one module comes in, and also that journal article. So um, just want to make you aware of that. A number of you noted uh, very interesting observations from the WEAC article of saying, you know, they pointed out some different court cases. And yeah, I mean, court cases are what dictates what special education is. Um, and not only special education, but a number of services in schools. I mean, laws get passed, and then the courts are left to kind of uh, decipher the meaning and, and apply. And kind of, here's the standard then. So it is, it's a weird process how that works. So module two that we are in now. So if you haven't completed everything you needed to do in Module 1, get back in there, complete it, and get into Module 2 and make sure you're hitting the, the deadline. So Module 2, we have the JURN, which is J-U-R-N dot org article. I, I like JURN if you're doing any research on um, a number of topics, but if, you know, school inclusion, things like that. You can go into Google Scholar. JURN gives you a lot more resources. Google Scholar will give you like the, here's eight pages. And by the way, you have to pay $35 if you want the rest of it. JURN's not going to do that to you. Um, and I think JURN also gives much more current information. So um, you can kind of take a look at that that article from JURN versus the WEAC article and and just the, the difference between what a research article on inclusion looks like versus more or less just an informational article that's written by WEAC. Not that the WEAC article doesn't have its purpose. It's a good starting point and to make, you know, bring some awareness to it. But it's very surface level. It's very surface level. Um, so we have the timeline assignment in this module. So I encourage you to be creative. Um, on what topic you pick for the timeline and even how you represent that, whether you're using a Prezi, um, you know, some people use Time Toast, a program, it's, you know, however you want to do that. I mean, you can be 
traditional and use a PowerPoint or even a Word document to delineate up, um, you know, with years to make sure you have your points and your timeline. But, uh, and a lot of people will include like photos in their timeline that go along, uh, to help build context text. I, I think that's a good idea. So, um, but yeah, be creative. Again, this is a class that encourages different ways to demonstrate learning. And we'll talk a lot in module six about universal design for learning, how it's just not for teachers, but for students, students demonstrating learning in different ways versus just like writing, you know, the, the written assignment. Um, so yeah, be as, be as creative as, as you want. Um, you know what the expectations are for that assignment. And I posted a few samples. We also are introduced to our good friend, Ro Vargo during this module. Um, that's in your textbook. If you do not have your textbook yet, get the textbook. Um, and you know, again, when you, Read about row, and this is what I really love about the textbook. Now I know the textbook I, I need to update and I've been looking at some others because, um, you know, it's been around for a while, but I, I really like the narrative aspect of the, of, of the textbook. When you, when you read about row, there's, there's two things I want you to tune into. One is your, your reactions when you're reading that. What your first order reactions are, kind of your gut reactions to, to row. For example, like when the the peer was invited to the birthday party and, and her mom called Ro's mom and said, you know, can I get a, a jump rope for Ro? Like, would that be a good gift? And, and you know, Ro's mom was like, oh, my goodness, like this 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 other parent doesn't know that Ro is, uses a wheelchair, doesn't, doesn't use a jump rope, although, like, you can have a jump rope. Actually, if you look at the 1998 to 2001 Sesame Street introduction, there is a child in a wheelchair who's swinging a jump rope as part of the intro. But, um, but anyway, what your, your first order reactions are, what your, your gut feeling is with, with row. And then I want you to push yourself to pause and then go into a second order response of saying, why do you feel that way? So like, you know, do you feel, you know, that, you know, I feel, you know, row is, is, um, you know, brave or whatever, or, okay, you feel that way. Why do you feel that way? Why do you feel that way? And it's like, well, yeah, because, you know, maybe through Rose's eyes, there were a lot of things that she saw that she knew she wasn't capable of doing, and she would try it and wasn't successful, but then would try it again. Um, or that, you know, Ro was, you know, was brave because she was, you know, um, she was outgoing, even though she knew not everyone, you know, was going to be positive toward her, or she might have, you know, people that have a bias toward a, a, a disability, whatever. But um, I want you to get into kind of the the why you feel the way you do. So you're going to have that first visceral response, and then kind of study the why. And that why might even come back to, you know, I feel this way because, you know what, when I grew up, I remember students with disabilities. I remember the yellow mobile home. And I remember, like, I I was more apprehensive of students with disabilities because no one shared anything about disability awareness. So maybe I feel, you know, Roe is brave because, you know, this book was, was written in, what, 2005? And, and this was a time when, and, and by reading this, it, it doesn't seem maybe there was a lot of disability awareness. So, you know, Roe really had to rise above in conveying, you know, who she was because that wasn't being done, you know, just through school, like PBIS type things, you know, positive behavioral intervention supports. They weren't around really in 2005. So just things like that. First in order, second thing. First in order, first order, second order thinking. First order, what you feel. Second order, why you feel that way. So we are now into shout outs. Matthew. Matthew, you wrote children who learn together, learn to live together. And you also wrote about the, uh, um, quote, the ability to deal with students who have multiple different personalities and who may not agree on anything. So this was a benefit of in inclusion. And, uh, I have a story to add to that. I, I worked with a student with a disability who had a very, very strong personality. <laughs> and 
really wasn't aware of it. Um, and I think the personality developed over time. This, the, she, there were other siblings in the family, and I think this, this student needed to, to just kind of have this strong personality to make sure that she was heard amongst her peers. Um, and I remember very clearly, um, this student was on your book committee and basically would put out an idea. And if people didn't agree with it, then too bad. She was going to fight for this idea no matter what. And if someone else put out a different idea, she would immediately dismiss it. And I talked to her about that and I said, we need to work on perspective taking. <laughs> like, um, you know, why, what was wrong with the other person's perspective in your opinion? Was it because like it wouldn't fit on the page or it didn't, it was more or less though, it didn't conform to what she, her perspective, what her viewpoint, which she thought was superior. Um, and it wasn't done in a vindictive way or, or an angry way. This is just a conditioned way. So we made great strides in that with her, but she had a hard time taking others perspectives. Um, and I, I think you, you talk about that in your, in your post when you had the post to children who learn together, learn to live together, the importance of perspective taking. Um, I also work with a, a student, um, who is, will be gra graduating with her associate's degree and she needed to work, uh, e extremely hard at her personal self-advocacy skills to make sure that her disability awareness not disability, her disability accommodations plan was carried out in the school um, at the university. So needing to go and, yeah, and meet with instructors a few times, a disability coordinator, um, needing, you know, enlarged print, things like that. It wasn't always provided. And then she said, you know, it was hard because after a couple times, I didn't want to like be the squeaky wheel. I didn't want to go to the instructor three, four times because then you kind of get that feel of like, you know, almost like you're, your pest, your irritating the instructor. And she said, but yet, like, I knew this was what I needed. Like, I can't read this stuff if it's in 12 fonts. It has to be 18. Um, or like, it has to be emailed to me ahead of time. Um, and, and so she would, she would go back and, and she would be very strong in advocating for that. Um, and again, you know, because of that, and she had that strong drive within her, she was able to stay a part of that class, contribute, um, you know, do a lot of great things with her classmates, be in different groups, and will graduate with her associate's degree, and she's going on for her bachelor's degree. But she shared with me something very interesting, and she wants to actually do a video um, on self-advocacy, and, and she's, she's really a fighter when it comes to self-advocacy, but... She said, you know, a lot of students, they get to college and, and they're not going to have kind of the drive that I'm going to have to, to keep going back to the instructor, or back to the disability coordinator. They're going to do that a couple times and then they're going to not want to, to, um, you know, ruffle feathers anymore. And, and then they're going to become frustrated because the accommodation isn't provided and then they're probably going to drop out. And it's very true. I mean, that happens. So I think we, we need to, to work very hard. On, on making sure that we're providing, you know, the appropriate accommodations and supports to help students, um, learn together. So those are examples of, of more secondary, but, um, Darlene, Darlene, your shout out. You referenced the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education ruling of separate is not equal. And you noted the movie Return of the Titans. You know, in the moment, the moment I read your post, I was thinking Return of the Titans, and then I got down a few lines, Return of the Titans. Yes, an excellent movie to delineate, um, the, you know, what it was, was like right after separate, but, but equal. And, you know, it's, it's a football themed movie, um, with, with, um, you know, an, an African American coach and largely, um, you know, a, a, a team of, of both Caucasian and, and, and white players, but it's the first time that they've, they've moved to a African American coach. 
um, and, and really working to put the differences aside of race and focus on football. Um, but there's, there's, you know, it's really done with, with intent of, of message in it. So, and also thank you so much for sharing Tori Dunlop's TED talk about inclusion. Uh, it's something I might use in a future class. I've bookmarked it. I want to go through and watch the entire presentation. I, I watched part of it. I liked it and analyze how I might incorporate that in a class. But thank you so much for posting the link for all of us to benefit from that. And something else is um, I, you know, the term regular education students, spe- and students and special education students, that never felt right with me either. Like I, I don't like the term your regular education, your special education. And I think that the only compromise I can come up with right now under what the, the legalities of the law is to say, all students are regular education students, and some students are also special education students. So all are regular education students. Some are also special education students who receive special services, I guess, is the way that I would put it. Um, so it does not, once you are identified as having a disability and receiving special education services, it does not separate you, remove you from that regular education population. Um, Jeremy, your comprehensive reflection of the WEAC article was outstanding. Thank you. Um, you put forward some benefits of inclusion, such as reduced fear of human differences. And I think that is a huge, huge barrier. The fear, the anxiety of, like, I don't know how to approach this, this person. Um, and I'm going to give a, give a story about that. Um, I worked with a man, um, when I was at CISA 5 who was, who was blind. Actually, I work with him now. It's Dave Hyde. We talked about this in a, in a, one of my radio shows anyway, so it's, it's nothing to, to not be explicit about here. But, uh, when he started at CISA 5 up in Portage, um, one of the, one of the, the staff put pink flamingos all the way up the walkway to, and it goes up to where CISA 5 is, all along the sides. And, you know, people thought it was just kind of a spoof thing. You know, like you, your pink flamingos in the yard type of thing, or, you know, down at, what is it, what is it uh, Bascom Hill, where they cover it with pink flamingos. Nobody really thought anything of it. Some kind of, some kind of joke, and, and then they were gone. This was actually purposeful. A lady had done that because she wanted to make sure he knew where the ends of the steps were. Because if you did step off, it was, you know, you'd go down six, eight inches and, and you could fall. And this was done as, as her way that she could help him identify where the sides were. Never told him, never told anybody, just had done this. Um, so I, I think it's that fear instead of like having, just asking him. And not that that was bad. Um, I think it, it, it shows wanting to do the right thing. But again, asking him sitting down and, and, and asking him. Actually, it got to a point where so many people had questions. We had a potluck. And at the potluck, one of the things was, and we let Dave know ahead of time, people wanted to know more about him and then also had some questions. And, um, and the questions were, you know, like, if we see you doing this, should we offer to help? Um, for example, one person said, one time I saw you walk into the ladies' restroom and I didn't stop you. <laughs> it was when he first started. And he said, well, obviously I'm not going to make that mistake again, but, um, but it was, it's one of those things where once you have questions answered, it's not only staff, it's kids. Allow kids the opportunity to ask questions about, um, about d- different disabilities. And not, not necessarily like what's going on with Jimmy, but, um, with different disabilities, you can use literature like uh, My Friend Will is a great book to read by Tara Tuchel to kids. Um, it's written by, I think, a second grade girl about her friend Will who has autism. It's, uh, it, it's a Wisconsin book. It's pretty cool. So, um, and, you know, the fear of differences. I remember, too, I'm reading your post. I'm thinking back. I remember 
when I went to Walmart and saw people using scooters, like for the first time, and year, you know, years ago, it'd be like, whoa, like you'd get out of Walmart, you get your shopping done, and it'd be like, that person used a scooter. Like I've never seen that before. And today, every time we go Walmart shopping, how many scooters do we see? I don't know. I mean, probably four, five, six. How many do we remember? Zero. I mean, it's just, it's common. It's just the way that it is. And it's, there's no novelty to it. It's what people use for mobility to get around the store. Um, so it's one of those things too, is when, once you demystify those things, um, they just become more native and, and include it and in inclusion sprouts from that. Get away of that fear. Um, Sherry, Sherry, your shout out. In a response to Kirsten, you wrote, times have changed and parents do need to, or do need help. So I understand why schools do so much more than they did in the past. I just wish some parents would try working with the school instead of fighting the school or not putting any effort into helping their kids education. So, um, yeah, it, it is a tricky, discussion to have right now because school, the, the roles of schools have changed considerably. Um, and I will say that um, I I think I definitely think um, parents want their children to do well in school. And a part that we don't see and I got to see this after when when I took the two years when I just worked on my dissertation at UW Madison under my fellowship, I walked my second grade daughter back and forth to school every day. And I would wait at the end of the day out in front of the school and then there'd be a group of parents and eventually we kind of got to know each other and, and we're talking and stuff. And um I remember one of the parents, her son had some disability that precluded him from sleeping. Like, and, and she was very fearful that, you know, if he hadn't slept the night before, she would let the school know, but then that they would, you know, kind of come down on her a little bit or, or look down on her that she wasn't able to do things to get her child, um, to bed on time. And so he'd be tired in school and sleeping in that. Now that's one perspective of the parent in, and, but she was actually, I could sense from her, there was a very much a level of respect for the school and for the teachers. And she was very fearful that she would be viewed as a bad parent, as an ineffective parent. So she felt she needed to kind of stand up and put this, this, this facade, you know, forward and, and kind of be on the defensive with the school. And I thought that was very interesting because that's not the way the school staff would have perceived that at all. They would have perceived this as a, as a parent who was probably, you know, difficult, uh, that, you know, the moment you suggest things that they were going to counter with, with, um, some reason, you know, why yeah, and feeling, you know, probably that they were attacked. So, um, I went to an elementary school uh, as part of my dissertation and studied this elementary. A number of schools I went to, but I stud studied in elementary. It was in a, a generational poverty area. And one of the things that this elementary school did is the community uh, donated toothbrushes and toothpaste for every single student at this elementary, so a few hundred students. And in the morning, the students would all brush their teeth because that was uh, a number of students hadn't, didn't brush their teeth. They didn't have that at home. Um, and the homes, um, the teachers would ride the buses and they would get to tour, you know, some of the homes if they were able to. But, um, you know, we're talking homes where, like, there aren't doors on cupboards and things like that. Um, and yet, you know, the, these, the, the parents were cooperative and the parents were supportive. It's just, it was generational poverty. It was really tough. So it was the school staff and the principal, you know, the decision that everyone was going to brush their teeth in the, the morning because that was essential. And then, um, you know, just, just the responsibility in, in the pride, sense of control over yourself, 
Um, and if students needed showers, then, then they had showers and things like that. Now I know, you know, we, we might look at that and say, this is school taking on responsibility of parent. And I guess that can be, that can be argued. Um, and I'm not saying that that actually doesn't, isn't happening in, in some of these situations. But the bottom line is the innate needs of the student are being better met. And the student is given some sense of control over his or her environment. And if the, the purpose of the student is to learn in school, they are much more likely to learn, um, you know, once they have brushed their teeth and their teeth are in good shape or they've, they've been able to wash up for the day and they do have a meal. So, um, again, you're com completely right in the role of the school has, has changed. Um, but if we come down to the, the core needs of students, whether that be provided by the school or home, innate needs of being fed, of, of having, um, basic hygiene taken care of, those are still essential no matter where they're provided. And to give the students the best opportunity for success at school, that's, that school example I just provided, um, that was an eye opener for me. I'd never seen that before. I'd never seen that before. Um. So, Bonnie, your shout out. Your introduction, uh, included denoting allocating $25,000 to purchase, uh, 10 new Mac Classic 2Es back earlier in your career. And, um, I, I thought that was a, uh, just a tr tremendous way to make the point that technology has become more native and inclusive as it has become more affordable. Uh, plus we have so many adaptive features that are built into technology. So, um, technology is promoting inclusion. Think about it. I mean, uh, personal devices, iPads have come down in, in price, Chromebooks, uh, cell phones can now, I mean, you know, you have 30 gig of memory. You can, you can set record so it can record a lecture. You can take snapshots of, uh, of a whiteboard. Um, you have all of these things built in, in, in where the text can be automatically enlarged just by pressing a few buttons. Um, and it's, it's like a Google Doc, so you can access those from home or from school. But if a student has an iPad and it has some apps um, that are specifically, you know, put on there to help the, the student um, with disability or need areas, you're able then to... I might have put a permanent mark on my desk here. Um, you're able to do that in a way where the student doesn't feel self-conscious. It's not 15, 20 years ago when you had a $20,000 Dynavox special communication device, you know, for a student that was definitely unlike anything else and took staff one hour a day just to program the thing. You know, now you have this, this, you know, iPad and everybody has iPads. So it's very native. We've become very native, which is also very inclusive. So good, good stuff. Um, Andrea, your shout out, uh, your WEAC article reflections. You talked about 504 plans and you said, you know, I've never done a 504 plan. And, uh, I'll tell you, 504 plans are foggy swamp lands. I don't believe there is anybody out there who can fluently describe what a 504 plan is. And if they can, and we take five other people, we are not going to have inter-rater reliability. Ultimately, a 504 plan is meant to remove a barrier that exists between the student and accessing education. In a very, very simple format, um, a 504 plan um you know, might mean that, um, a st uh, student, um, is provided with, um, a peanut free table, um, during lunch and that other students can then be with that student. But then the 504 plan is that other students' lunches would be checked to make sure that they didn't have any peanut products on them or cold lunches or whatever, and they could be with that student. That'd be a 504 plan, meaning that student is socially included. Um, you know, very, very simple things to, you know, like a ramp access. That's kind of 504 access. It's access. It's not necessarily like a therapy you're providing. 
it's access. It's more of a of a change in a structural procedural thing, f f so that student is able to um, to access curriculum. So, uh, so a 504 plan. We did that for um, a student with anxiety once. A middle school student with anxiety. Interesting story. It's a girl, seventh grader had severe anxiety and somehow it manifested it got worse and she couldn't step foot in the school um, now academically was still able to perform at, at a pretty high level but we put together a 504 plan because the barrier was a school where we put a monitor and a camera in her house and she was able then to skype in to the classroom which had this uh, camera and monitor and, and participate with her peers that way and then eventually we were able to get her back into the classroom for part of a day. And then eventually, you know, she was receiving outside counseling and things like that too and, and, and back a full day. That was done through a 504 plan. The barrier was access. Um, there wasn't any type of treatment that we were providing, any type of therapy um, for her. It was this medium. And then she was receiving um, outside, outside therapy for the um, anxiety disability. Um, Courtney, shout out. You questioned what is success? Great question. Great question. Um, that's where UDL, Universal Design for Learning, um, is going to come into play. That's in module six. We talk a lot about it. It's a big, big part of this class, although we work up to that. And, um, so what is success? And I, I think success to me is that the student is able to have divergent ways to demonstrate learning. Okay. Divergent ways. So whether, here's an example. Um, I work with a student who produces raps, high school student writes raps, has studied rap, knows how to write rap puts the lyrics together, the construct, and writes them up kind of about American history and like about political things, fits these into his, his political classes and writes these raps. Um, they're very appropriate, um, but he demonstrates clear learning of what's going on through these raps. And the teacher supports it, um, you know, which is, which is a great thing because the teacher could say no. Um, but, Wow, so this student is, is demonstrating learning through this different means, this more contemporary means. And, you know, what is success? So success, the feds will define success as attainment. That's also largely how the state does it on the school report card. It's attainment. It's ranking. Like, you want to rank higher than your neighboring districts. Um, success, though, is also growth, okay? If you go from 10% to 80%, but attainment is 90%, Come on. I mean, 10% to 80% is a 70% growth. Even, you know, you didn't get to 90, but you've had this massive growth. Celebrate it. So that's the part of recognizing growth versus attainment. And sometimes, um, school boards get so caught up on attainment. I was at a, I was at a school board meeting. It wasn't in my district. I was at a, in a different district. Um, and, and watched a middle or an elementary school present on just a tremendous, tr tremendous performance of students. Um, and it was across different areas. It was across academic areas and then also like in decreased discipline referrals and things. Really great stuff it was all reported to the board. And then all of a sudden there was a question of in the, in the teachers that set, you know, some personal goals for like, you know, the class and what they wanted certain reading scores to be, math scores, discipline, re office referrals, things like that. And there was a question that's like, hey, up at fifth grade, like we noticed that um, here was what your attainment goal was, but you didn't get there. And the there was a pause and the principal stepped in and said, yeah, you know, we're going to look at that what we're instructing, kind of do an item analysis, our common assessments. Um, but, like, yes, we didn't attain this. We did have quite significant growth, though, from where we were at. And the school board kind of dismissed that. Like, they were like, okay, but, like, your goal for attainment, you didn't attain that. <laughs> 
And I could feel the energy exit that room from all of the teachers who were with the principal presenting all of this great, all of this great information. Um, and, and this, the school board, um, just kind of got hung up on that, that one box, which was shaded yellow, you know, here's the box we're going to work on. And it's like, tell us more, give us your detailed plan on, on how to get that from growth, you know, from, to attainment and, and really missing the boat on that. Um, so that's where, you know, working with school boards is very important and educating school boards because school boards are elected, new people come in and, and they don't, necessarily fully understand the difference between growth and attainment and the, what the rhetoric is you get you know, where the state wants you to be with attainment and and I felt bad for the teachers that night I felt bad when I left that meeting because I could see in their eyes out of everything they presented all of this great news and, and some of the stuff was like through the roof it's like here's what we expect and like here's where the students perform like whoa it was just phenomenal um, everything was was kind of deflated by the board, just like, ooh, but what's what went on over there? And tell us more about that versus saying, um, okay, um, looks like you know you had growth in that area, and can you tell us more about what you know what you're going to be doing doing in that area, and, and let the teachers have an opportunity, and then, and then like close it out with saying, wow, you know we really are appreciative of what everybody has done. Uh, we celebrate you. We celebrate the students and, and thank you very much. So Timothy, your shout out grow, uh, growth first attainment. That was according, uh, Timothy, um, you indicated. Okay. So when I, I read about your, your son and kind of, you know, all the testing, the standardized testing he went through. So I felt empathy when reading you shared that your son stated, Dad, school was good. We finally are done with testing. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. But, um, yeah, I mean, testing. We test so much. We test so much. And that, it's very hard for inclusion, you know, when we are putting this pressure on what, you know, largely attainment and not growth. Um, so we must, you know, we have to be aware of that balance between testing and inclusion. Um, and inclusion, what I mean by that is inclusion is fostered through academic success, but it's also fostered through cultural development, doing activities such as restorative circles, um, community building in, in, in classrooms, and that builds school culture and school connectedness. So if everything is shifted over to testing, it's not really much of an inclusive environment as an environment where you're sitting there and just getting drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled with academic instruction and, and not being able to express your yourself and not having those social bonds fostered. So it, it's tough. I understand it. I get it. Um, so we will, you know, we fund what gets tested. I talked about this before. Reading and math. That gets tested. That's on the school report card. That, that gets funded. That gets top billing, top priority. Um, I say, why are we not reporting out on school connectedness? You can re look to the 2009 CDC report on school connectedness. Still relevant, very relevant today. Basically said, you know, getting kids connected to school, a lot of the PBIS type things, a lot of restorative practices, but getting kids connected to kids, kids connected to school, school culture, has this massive impact on so many factors, um, you know, in, including, um, you know, academic performance, including attendance and, and decreased discipline. All of that is there. Um, I argued four years ago, it was May 22nd, so we're one day past the four year anniversary, but I presented on PBS about school safety and I said, if we want to get serious about school safety, we will have School report cards that not only report out reading and math and whatever gap stuff they want to do, but they will also report out school connectedness at the same value because we know that school connectedness relates to all of these other areas per a very extensive CDC report, which was a compilation of other very 
strong scientific reports um, on the study of school connectedness factors. So, um, so yeah, I think the school report card is incomplete. Need school connectedness. I said it four years ago. It's not there. Doesn't mean it's not important. Doesn't mean you shouldn't take that on as a priority to your school because we know the proven results of that are better academic performance in general, decreased um, truancy, and decreased discipline referrals. So, and your shout out in response to the history of inclusion timelines and readings, you wrote. Every time I read information about the history of education, I am shocked at the number of years it takes for new laws and amendments to be implemented. Also, the part of the history where the public uh, believed that students with a disability had criminal tendencies due to genetic makeup was shocking. Okay, two parts. One is, um, yeah, it takes a lot of years for these amendments to be um, implemented, and that's because... Once laws are passed, it's the court challenges which really define how the laws are put into practice. So that's how that gets done. And that was kind of mentioned somewhat in the WEAC article, but that's really how it gets done. Um, and then as far as, you know, the part of history where the public believe that students with disabilities have criminal tendencies – we talk about the part of history. The part of history actually goes back to 2012, December 2012, in Sandy Hook, when after Adam Lanza uh, had completed the massacre at Sandy Hook School, a sudden, a sudden push across the country to screen students with autism, especially high-functioning autism to see if there was a tendency for these students to be more prone um, to demonstrating harm toward others because of lack of social skills. Um, There needed to be much work done on the autism self-advocacy or uh, advocacy groups um, in awareness to, to quiet that down and to say, no, there isn't this doesn't exist. This, there isn't this connection. And first of all, you cannot profile a, a, a school shooter like that. That just has not been successful ever. Um, and I know that because I've, I've, that was the keystone of my presentation. Even the, even the FBI couldn't profile out Ted Kaczynski, um, the person um, who attempted the um, assassination of President Ford. Uh, just recently, the Joseph uh, Jakubowski uh, fugitive in Janesville, you know, that profile was was pretty far off. So um, I'm just saying, you know, we talk about history, but no, it, it actually happened, you know, really recently, just in 2012, where if you were a parent and your child had autism, especially high-functioning autism, and you're in a school in Wisconsin after Sandy Hook, you can bet that there were people in your district or maybe teachers who were just wondering a little bit, is there less capacity because of less understanding of empathy and social skills, possibly with um, students with uh, Asperger's, higher functioning autism, where there could be a likelihood um, to be more prone to bringing harm to others than students without autism. So nothing to support that at all. But yet, wow. So that's where we need to to stand up and and to fight that rhetoric when that happens. Uh, Kirsten, your shout out. You wrote, I did not realize how much thought goes into where students with special needs are placed. When students come to eighth grade, their plan has usually been figured out by the other two years of middle school. So I have not been able to participate in a decision like this. Okay. All right. The deal with that is... Um, every year, least restrictive environment should be discussed in detail at the IEP meeting. So what's happening when you have the student, um, that really is not a thorough discussion of placement. Placement needs to be discussed in detail and what the accommodations are and do these accommodations still need to be in place when that student is with you. So they, maybe they've been identified with a disability, but 
What happens a lot, and you, you, you mentioned it, eighth grade, but I've seen this a ton. You get to high school, and that senior IEP looks virtually identical to the freshman IEP. Goals don't change. Accommodations don't change. And here's what happens. People say, well... If it's working for the student now, why pull back on it? Why pull back? Then they might struggle, and we don't want that to happen. It's going to upset the parents. And if we pull back on services and the student goes to post-secondary and they see that they don't have as many services, they're not going to get as thorough of a accommodation plan in post-secondary. So we're just going to leave everything the way it is. Um, and that is really a disservice to the student. That is basically um, giving that student... Um, you know, not not pulling back those those services a little bit if you think it's warranted, and to see if that student can still demonstrate success. They might have some struggles, but you know, can can they work through those and, and demonstrate success? Otherwise, what happens? You graduate the student, and then all of a sudden it's like, hey, the supports of school are gone. Now you're in post secondary. Good luck. Um, and that happens a lot. And again, it's this apprehension. It comes in where. You know, you're, there's a, a fear that the parents are going to give pushback. Also, it's like, well, the IEP seems to be working, so let's keep it in place. And and then the fact that if we do decrease services, it's going to harm the student once they get to post-secondary. So you need to have those discussions. I think having them ahead of time with parents, too, helps. I'm just understanding and say, you know, um, I don't think we need to have all – I mean, it, I've seen accommodation pages, like pages. If you have – 30 accommodations listed for the student. That's unrealistic. No one's going to carry out 30 accommodations. It's just not going to happen. Narrow down and prioritize to what is most important. And if it's something you know, like preferential seating or whatever, well, you know, the fact is maybe that doesn't need to be there anymore. Um, or does the student need notes? Or is the fact now that the student is able to do that on their their own? Because, you know, the way that the classes are set up, the notes are already on online, or the student can can you know record notes with their iPad or or you know something like that. So I'm just saying, um, what you're describing, I've seen a lot. I've seen a lot in that discussion of least restrictive environment should not be shut down at sixth grade. So, um, which sounds like you know by the time they, they get to you up at, at eighth grade things kind of stay from that plan into when they graduate. And finally, Patrick, your shout out. You wrote the other question from the beginning that constantly nags at me is, is this really the best environment for the student to be in? To some extent, everyone has students who are going to struggle. And I think that is where it is really important to have that continuum of placements that was mentioned in the article. If you truly do have a good continuum of placements for students, it makes the struggles that students um, have turn into a fruitful struggle as opposed to them uh, struggling and never being able to come out ahead. So I, I agree with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with struggling. We all struggle, um, meaning if you, know, you find out you basal where a student's ability is, you typically don't put the work at that level you know, you put the work a little bit beyond that level, so they have to strive toward that. And if you struggle and you encourage and and you work through that and accomplish, um, there's 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 much value in that. Now, perpetual struggle, no. I mean, you don't want anyone to perpetually struggle and burn out and get this discouraged on things. Um, but I think, as you indicated, I like the term fruitful. Struggle. I, th I think it's an excellent way to put it. Um, and uh, we, we're getting into this position right now where if a student struggles, that's being seen as ineffective teaching and as not meeting the IEP and, and all of these things. And I'm like, whoa, it's okay to struggle just as long as we are recognizing that, we're aware of that, we're supporting the student through that and saying, keep working through this. Let's try, let's try a different approach. Well, um, let's, instead of this, let's try this. Let's try this. That's universal design for learning too. Of, of, of maybe they struggle because they just don't demonstrate learning in this way very well. But yet, like that, that boy I talked about who can rap, 
he can demonstrate learning at a very high level. I mean, his, his stuff is very articulate. He writes it down. I mean, he, he takes pages and pages and puts this stuff together and researches and kind of develops out his constructs. And you look at it and like, you've got this stuff. But if he were to write a paper, if he was to go up and to do a presentation, um, it would be difficult. Interesting thing. Also, the student is disfluent, stutters. If he raps, he doesn't stutter. If he has to come up in front of class and present, he stutters. There's something about the, the rap man, the scat man, scat man. If you look on YouTube, um, there's, there's a singer called the scat man, S C A A T M A N. And he, he sings and he's completely fluent when he sings. If you talk in person or watch interviews with him, he's disfluent. Um, so, uh, again, I think struggles are okay as long as they're not perpetual. Um, we have much, you know, we have much pressure on us today to create this fail-free environment. The word fail has become stigmatized. The word fail has become stigmatized. And, you know, again, I'm saying if you do that, it's harder to create an inclusive environment if the moment the student struggles in that environment, it's like, nope, we need a different setting. Like, this isn't going to work. So, and, and I'm going to get into some structural things later in class, too, like, um, you know, I, I also understand fully, like if you have students with, with special needs in the classroom, that then the supports need to follow. So whether it be pushing services from physical therapy, uh, the reading therapy specialist, um, speech, you know, whatever, that those are coming to you or, or some co-teaching or special education coming in, you know, though, or support staff, that needs to be there. I mean, there's some structural things too. So we'll talk about those, but, um, uh, Anyway, I, I'm, I'm just going to close out that statement of what you have is right now universities are experiencing a, sh experiencing a sharp uptick in the hiring of counselors. This is happening across the United States. And what's, hap what's happening? What, what's driving it is students, freshmen are coming in and they're getting challenged on their position. They get a paper back and, and there's some feedback and they're perceiving that as either a microaggression of like, you don't agree with my position? Like, why are you against me? Versus like just having, here's a different perspective to take on this. You know, not necessarily saying you're wrong. I'm just trying to open you up to different perspectives. But no, that becomes a microaggression. And students are having a real hard time coping with feedback that isn't celebrating every single thing that they write, that this is the greatest thing ever of, of saying, you know what, like I like this. But I think this was not complete. You know, I, I think you could add these things to it. So that's great. I mean, that's what we want. We want growth. But the student is looking at that and saying, oh, my goodness, like, I can't believe this. I th This wasn't feedback that I had received before. I feel like a failure and all of these things. Um, so it, it, it's really, it's really, really hard. Um, I'm going to give one story and then I'll end it. There was... Um, I believe this, this might have been in, in Wisconsin, um, a debate class, and it was for freshmen or sophomores. And one of the students felt, and this was recently, it's like in the past year, one of the students felt like they had mastered the art of debate. Like they were, they were the best at debate. And, um, uh, really were getting their debate skills more from the media and from the rhetoric and watching the, the political campaigns. And the student was challenging the, the faculty, the instructor, and just saying, you know, the way you're teaching us is, isn't right. Like there's a better way to do this. And, and, and whatever the instructor was like, well, uh, okay. You know, uh, I'm going to give you a chance to debate me, use your strategies. I'll use my traditional debate strategies, which are what I'm instructing based upon, you know, Socrates and, and Plato and getting to understand other pe people's positions and articulating those positions back to them as, as well as how they're able to articulate those. So you understand their position, where they're trying to come from, and then you're trying to inform what you see as as parts of that position which aren't complete but anyway within a few minutes the the teacher um you know quickly was was asking the student you know things like 
well, what is, you know, what's your evidence for that? Or, or give your basis or help me better to understand why you're saying what you're saying. Very tactfully, very respectfully. And this other student just cracked, just lost it, was feeling attacked, needed to leave, needed to go to a safe space, felt attacked, a microaggression that this teacher had gone off after them. Um, you know, and none of that was, was accurate at all. None of that was accurate. And it was, this teacher was not being vindictive or anything like that. What was, was truly, the student was asking to showcase these skills, um, that they felt were superior to the, to the teacher. And the teacher then was, was, you know, just pointing out, you know, no, you're, you're using kind of first order thinking here in rhetoric. So here's what I'm pointing out to you so you can become better at what you're doing. So, you know, kudos to you for wanting, you know, wanting to, to do this and, and putting yourself out there. Um, but all of a sudden taking that personally, instead of saying, um, you know, you know what I do have, I do have more to learn. So what do you recommend, um, you know, that the student could say to a teacher, what do you recommend that I, that I say to defend this? So if you were in my shoes, like what, what should I have done? Because I, I thought I had this figured out. And you could really have that as a learning experience, but no, it's this quickly, you know, running away from it that I'm attacked. You're not agreeing with my position. You have a perspective that's different than mine. So, um, you know, all of those things I think compromise inclusion. So, I look at this. This thing's all marked up in, in orange now. That's the way it's going to be um, in infinity because we are done with this week's fireside chat. They're not all going to be of this length. I can't say they're all going to be shorter. They probably mostly will be. But um, again, I very much appreciate the posts that you've made, your depth, um, your your insight. You know, you can be very honest during your posts. Be active posters. I look forward to your your timelines of inclusion. You know, whatever whatever you decide to come up with in that. And please, you know, look at look at the samples, get some ideas. So. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, just as I close this out, at SafetyPhD, at SafetyPhD, all the stuff is up above. Um, some people do choose to do that because I, I do um, a, a show, radio show, weekly on uh, school, well, typically school safety, but safety in general. I think it's good for anybody to to hear. I talk a lot about also purpose and agency, and I do a number of interviews Um so it's something too that I think contributes to an inclusive environment in, in, in a big way. So thank you very much. Let's have a great module to any questions. Text me, email me. I'll be glad to talk with you. Um, so no, no, no hesitations there. Thank you very much. And let's hope for some warm weather. What is it? Like 48 degrees and raining out right now? I don't know. I worked over the weekend. I put in a new shrub outside. We had this, this 30 plus year old burning bush, which had given up the ghost, dug out and stuff. And then I dug an entire wheelbarrow full of dirt out and put in like new soil and stuff. And, and it was like 48 degrees, misting and windy. It was the most miserable landscaping experience I had probably in my entire life, but it like it needed to get in. And it looks good, but, uh, but I'm like, it's almost June. And yesterday, yeah, I mean, it was, I, I think I'm like, Where's my winter coat? Why did I put that thing away? Um, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'm looking ahead here. It looks like 70 degrees coming up. Monday the 29th, you do not have to access the class that day, you know, on Memorial Day. So, you know, again, the 29th, you do not have to access the, the class. Appreciate the Memorial Day weekend. Appreciate those who have uh, given their given their lives um, for our country, who continue to serve our country and everyone just ha has contributed you know to making america um, the best uh, country the the most outstanding wonderful uh, place to live on our earth so thank you very much to our our veterans and thank you to everybody um, who contributes to the you know betterment of our of our country thank you very much